Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 29. I will pour out my spirit all on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all my income, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man bent down, went down to his home, justified, rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Pour out your spirit. In today's uh, lectionary scriptures, I saw a message for us today of um, prayer, of prayer. I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, show you the revelation I had with it. But before I do, uh, we, need to, we need to get there and, and break these, this lectionary down, these scriptures down. Um, some magnificent truths are, are tucked away in the scripture. The first one made me think of, um, uh, well, the first one I made uh, is going to be the, was the last one. We're going to start in Luke. And this made me, this reminded me of a, of a story that happened last year when I was at uh, America, in, when I was in um, my Power and Justice philosophy class. And I made a lot of different friends. And I, that's a real blessing about going to the University of Rhode Island and my major is I made, I made a lot of people, a lot of friends that have the same interests that I do. And it's an absolute joy and privilege to be able to, uh, to, to go there and to share in these conversations as a philosophy major. And um, I hope you're not overly sick of me sharing my stories with you, but it's, it's my life and I want to share how God touches me in my life. So this scripture reading here talks about the uh, tax collector. And every time I, anytime I do the scripture reading, I always, uh, I'm always afraid that there might be a tax collector in the congregation and just walks up and, and, and storms out offended. Uh, now, now, a little bit of Bible study was that uh, this was not necessarily for all tax collectors, but this was talking about people that were being corrupt within the tax system. So they would, they would figure out what you owe, and then they would uh, pocket the, the rest for themselves. So this is obviously a real problem during the time, because it's for, for to make the scriptures that these people must have been going around and conning a lot of uh, people out of their money. Or not conning, just taking it through force. Maybe some of us feel that way today. If you get a letter from the IRS, just remember, if you get a phone call saying that you have to go to CVS to purchase a gift card to the IRS, that's a scam. Don't do it. Okay. So here we have, he also told this parable. And we know what parable means, that it's like something. It's like something. This story uh, talks about two people here. One person that saw themselves as all that, right? And, and that's, that's a problem that pastors can run into, right? Because we... We like to wear our fancy garb, and, and, and you know, if you're not careful, the ego gets in the way, and it's like, oh, thank goodness I'm like everyone else. I'm not like everyone else. I'm, I'm really religious and holy, and God must really think I'm swell. So I think that on the surface here, what we have is a message of humility, humility within our worship, within our, our, our beliefs, within, as I've been preaching uh, the last few months on, and how we view God in our culture, right? That how, you know, we really do place God in a box oftentimes. So if we have this idea of humility coming to God, I, I think there's some sincerity that can be proclaimed in our witness in the good news, uh, the gospel news, the good news for all. So here we have, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but we have this man who's talking about all the great things he's doing within the church. And then we have this other person who recognized that what they were doing is wrong. Okay, so here is just a message of repentance too, isn't it? It's a man that, that knew that what he was doing is wrong and he didn't feel worthy. And here, I'm just going to give the punchline right away. The, this is the most magnificent part of this scripture in my opinion. And, and he's welcome in the kingdom of God. 
God meets us in our brokenness. God meets us where we are. Never wanting us to stay there because God has a potential within us that, that, is, that is called to elevate our, not only ourselves but others into proclaiming the message of life. So I love this message that, you know what? You know what? I don't have to be any better than I am and God still loves me. And because God loves me, that gives me the inspiration to receive of the Holy Spirit to, to be elevated up and, 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 to, and, and to be a better person. Amen? So it's not that I have to do something different to receive of this love, but, but to recognize that I am loved, even in my brokenness. Okay, so this is where the message connects to, my, um, to an experience I had last year um, in my power and justice class. I have a, a friend. Uh, they, came to, they came to church last year. If you remember, Mike and John, they, they visited. And uh, my friend Mike and I, we would have many philosophical uh, discussions and one of which is he is called an egotist. An egoist is um, someone that believes, philosophically speaking, that we do everything because it makes us feel good. And, he, and, and, and the opposite of that is called altruism. Altruism is when you do something just because it's the right thing to do. So if I see somebody hungry on the street and, and I give them money because it makes me feel good, then that would be the philosophical term egoist. And if I give the money reservedly, but I know it's the right thing to do, then that's an um, altruist. Uh, if you guys ever remember that old episode of Seinfeld when George was putting money in the chip, chip jar for the uh, purse at the coffee shop, and, um, and, the, and the waitress didn't see him do it, so he took the money back out so he could put it back in, and all she saw was him taking the money out? <laughs> that's an egoist. <laughs> And it, and it backfired for him because not only did he not get the recognition that he was looking for, but he got the opposite result. So um, I, I just thought this is uh, interesting how the scripture has evolved in my life, in my journey, where I see that this is a message of the two. Now, my friend Mike would say to you that there's no such thing as um, altruism. He says every single thing humans do is for um, ego alone. And he says, I de defy you to, to prove me wrong. And I said, well, Mike, I don't want to preach to you being a preacher and all, but I said, I think Jesus Christ is a good example of altruism. I said, I don't think he felt too good the day he was at Calvary. And he said, I think it's a genuine example of altruism. And he said, well, I'm not going to get into the mind of the divine, he said, but with him excluded. And I said, well, I would like to think that as his Christians called to, uh, be where, um, to, to be a follower of Christ in the Holy Spirit, that we do follow a message of altruism. Because it is good to do things and makes you feel good. Right, guys? I'm not trying to put us down for that. It's okay to feel good to do good. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's not what this message is. But there is a message where it's sometimes we have to do things that we feel we're called out of love, even when it doesn't necessarily fit within our cultural DNA. There's a philosopher, I believe it was Kant, that said that if you feel your first gut instinct is that it's not something I should do, but then you're compelled to do it, you're on the right track. <laughs> I don't know, that's a little generic. But the idea is, as followers of Jesus Christ, it says in the scriptures that we are adopted into this new family. And by being adopted into this new feeling, we are, we, we are called to be new people. And that is not something, oftentimes we think that this must be some kind of magical overnight Shazam moment. And some, for, for some of us it is. But even within that, that conversion moment of when we see that we have been now loved by the divine and that we are called to greatness, we also still, it, we, it's the beginning of a journey, not the end. And the beginning of this journey is that the old us is still part of us. And so it takes time for us to see with these new eyes in new ways. I believe this is that message where this man who didn't feel worthy was able to recognize the fact that he, his old ways are not a way of life, but a way that's rather destroying him. This tax collector would have been somewhat wealthy, by some standards, very wealthy. And we, you know, we might look at him as, oh, what a villain, but he's probably just a regular person that recognized that the way he's living within a culturally accepted condition of the time. He wasn't doing anything he wasn't allowed to do, but he was exploiting people and he realized that and he realized it was now time for something more. Or how am I this tax collector? Now we don't do this to put ourselves down. We don't do this so we fall to our knees saying I'm not worthy like the tax collector, but we do this to recognize God's love for us in spite of the things that we fall short in. 
And again, when we embrace this love of the divine, we can start doing something better. And when we do something in the, in the, when we're yoked with Christ, yoked with God, then we feel that blessing upon us. When we... This is the message of prayer that I saw or I was convicted in when I, when I read the scripture today. And I've shared this message with you. Who here has a hard time praying for their enemy? Who here knows that it says in the scriptures that we have to pray for our enemy? Yeah, right. Um, when I saw this division in, in this morning's scripture, I realized that God welcomes us where we are in our brokenness. And in this division, I realize, uh, I've been preaching pretty heavy about some issues that are happening in our nation and such. I want to pull back on that. But I, I do want to recognize that it does seem like that we have this, no, we definitely have this division of us or them. And that's turning into people being our enemies. And um, I, I think maybe, it, well, I think more than maybe, I think as Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, that we need to be, this is something we need to focus on today. That we need to realize that even those that we may deem enemy, which is a strong word, or maybe those we deem other than us, uh, maybe, maybe we need to remind ourselves that it's time for us to pray for them. And not, not just to change them, O oh Lord, as I see, but to pray for them that they are reminded that they are loved by God as we are loved by God. You know, there's a lot to be said about praying for our enemies um, and about praying for others. And I've shared this with you where the core message for me is if I pray for someone, then my heart is changed towards that person. So I'm not just praying for their heart to be changed, but I'm also praying for my heart to be softened to their plight, to what brings them to where they are. Now this sounds a little judgmental, isn't it? But that's what we do, right? We judge people. And so if we start praying for people, maybe it's a time for us to recognize that maybe I don't have it all figured out either and see if we can find some areas of uh, bipartisanship. Amen? Where I can maybe understand for a moment that this person that I'm not getting along with has fears, has desires, has needs, has loneliness, and is loved by God. No more, no less than God loves us. When we pray for someone, those needs become apparent to us. So, as we start October, which I love, right? It's great that we're going to go out and pick up some socks and put them in the box. And it's great that it's not going to cost us that much money, right? We're in a, you know, socks aren't that expensive nowadays. Um, but what if we pray for those that, that need those socks? Now, I'm not saying they're our enemies, but I think they are the forgotten. Michelle is saying one of the greatest needs we have is the nursing homes, the forgotten. Many times you go to a nursing home, there are many forgotten. Perhaps there's somebody that's finding themselves in, somehow homeless, didn't know how they got there. And maybe a nice pair of socks would just give a little extra hope for their plight. But what's if we pray upon those socks, not for the socks, but for the feet that they'll be, that will find a home? And when we do, I think our heart will start to look at things in our nation differently. You know, we start with a pair of socks and we say, well, what, 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 what could we do as Christians to elevate, to help more? So, is your prayer grounded in um, ritual? Is your prayer sincere, earnest, where it's just like you talking to a friend? Do you pray for your enemies? These are questions I want you, invite you to ask yourself this week. Do you not pray? Do you think it's silly to pray? Are your prayers one-sided? Do you not expect for the person on the other side of the line to speak to you? I invite you this week to spend some time on this. To ask yourself when the last time you had a nice conversation with the creator of the universe. When's the last time that we stopped? I didn't ask for permission for a person sharing this. I'll just, I won't say a name, but, but uh, they were sharing how they light a candle when they wait upon receiving the voice of God. When's the last time we paused? Not to, not to pray feverishly to win the lottery or, or to, to put damnation upon our enemies, but rather to give thanks that God loves us in spite of us. That's your, my invitation for you today. Now, in the message of Joel, 
Joel, there's a, lots of connections to this, to this today, but I'm going to share just the one that, that spoke to me. How is it possible that we can be part of something magnificent, magnificent new life in that creation? When I, in that parable, am both. I am at times when, hey, look at me. And when I'm not and I'm humble, I say, hey, look at how humble I am. Hey, right, the conundrum. And also be the other side where I'm just broken. Because it's really that parable is speaking to us in, in the whole. We're both. How is this possible for this kind of conversion? And I'm not talking again that instant conversion, recognizing that you're loved by the divine, is amazing. And not everybody has it, but if you do, it's amazing. Other people have a long journey and some may never feel it. But how do we, in this conversion of moving forward in steps, how do we, how is this possible? And I think briefly Joel speaks of this. And it's something that we forget at times. But it's a promise that God pours out the Spirit. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And look at the inclusive message. Now the language is a little rough, right? But it's saying, it's saying even those, um, uh, for even the male and female slave. What it's saying here very plainly is this Spirit, this gift of God, is for who? Everyone. And this isn't just a rare occurrence. This isn't like I just flip the Bible up and I find that one thing. You hear this message from me when I, when I proclaim the good news. This is a message for all. And if, the, if God, our creator, includes this spirit for all, then who am I to exclude anyone? Who am I not to pray for those around me? Even when I know they're wrong. Or even when I know I'm right. It's a reminder for us that this gift is given. And I say, I don't mean to be cliche, has been given freely, but it costs so much. When I was listening to the song this morning, um, a One Pair of Hands, which uh, Bob shared with me a few years ago, and I, I realized I haven't played it in a while, and I felt like it fit well here. Um, because I, I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, and and um, my ego wants me to always be strong enough, good enough to do all of it. I share with you some clips sometimes about how our ego can push God aside at times. And I was thinking when I was singing the song with all of you today about one pair of hands, it made me think of this, this idea of Joel with the Spirit giving to us and about God reaching out for us when we're, when we're falling short. And it made me remind me, Ed Winner was talking about Disney, going to Disney next month, and I was remembering about a time that we went to Disney, and I was, just, I was only 13 years old, but uh, we went during... Um, February vacation, and when we came home, my, my house has a, um, a really steep um, driveway, and it was all iced over, and my dad had this big camper, and he was driving up, and it was like, it was like two in the morning, and he just couldn't get the camper up the hill, right, and so we parked halfway, and it's, it's really steep, and he said, okay, everybody out, and so when I got out, I, um, I slipped, and I fell, and my body twisted, and I went on my back, and I started heading under this camper that started to slide. And my life flashed before my eyes. I was only 13, so it didn't take as long as others. I thought I was dead. I honestly thought I was dead. I, I, it, was, it was, you know how it is when you fall on ice, right? And I just slipped around, slipped under, went under the camper. The camper started do, 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 back. I'm like, I'm dead. I was right under the, the front wheel, the front wheel. And I looked up, and there was my dad with his hand up. And, he, and, and it's like, you know, the strongest man on the planet, right? You know how dad is, right? And, and he pulled me up, like, and when I was doing this song today, Bob, I, that, that, I remembered that story, and I'm like, man, if we can get that out of Joel today, right? That, that power of the Holy Spirit, that even when we slip up, even when we fall, that there's this almighty hand, a loving hand, a gracious hand that's reaching out for us, saving us in the moment, right? In the now, Man, are we reaching up? Are we looking out? Are we all too busy looking down? I could have looked at that tire and never saw that saving hand. I could have just kept looking at the problem. Just would have kept sliding down until I hit the end of it, rather than looking up. So I invite us to look up. I invite you this week to ask some questions on who you are in prayer and an invitation that we look up together for that almighty hand of love, grace, and all power. Amen.